uh, well known to some of us as a lean friend and a pointer out of errors in published mathematical proofs. <laughs> She'll be telling us about um, formalizing stuff using lean. Formalizing stuff using lean. Uh, <laughs> yes. That's, I mean, that's what it is. It's just an hour of lean propaganda. Uh, it's it's uh, zero. Uh, how I wanted. I'm a pure mathematician. I've been doing. T I did 25 years of doing, you know, algebraic number theory. Nothing to do with formal proof verification. Uh, and maybe I should say before I start that I I saw Tom's talk uh, in Big Proof One uh, live stream from the Newton Institute. Uh, and it changed my life. I mean, there's no other way to, to it completely change my work trajectory. And, uh, and then later on, I read Jeremy's article uh, in the uh, in the notices of the AMS, and it had this phrase in it about how mathematicians need to put some skin in the game, and that really got under my skin. Uh, and it's a good phrase. Uh, and this is my attempt to. I mean, lots more needs to be done, but this is somehow my response to that comment. So, because of that, I want to digitise some parts of mathematics. Uh, and which parts? <coughs> so the parts I want to digitise, I want to digitise our undergraduate curriculum because we're going to rewrite our curriculum. Uh, I'm one of the many committees I'm on is the Curriculum Review Committee at Imperial College London, and I'm supposed to be rewriting the entire maths curriculum from the, you know, from the ground up. And I'm going to digitise some of it because it will just look, you know, it will just look weird and cool and different. Uh, so I want to digitise undergrad. I know lots of it's been done in Cock. You know, a bunch of it's been done in Lean. I just want to, you know, we're going to make some documents. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to make something. Uh, but I'm interested in getting undergraduates to digitise undergraduate level mathematics, and I'm interested in digitising really difficult things uh, because because Tom is going to need them at some point. Uh, and, and I'm just sort of practicing, I mean, somehow, I don't really know if the project's open yet, but I'm practicing <laughs> for, for when it opens. Uh, so those are the two things that I'm thinking about so far in general, uh, but other things might come to mind and that's fine. Uh, so why do I want to do this? I mean, the main reason is because I'm having a midlife crisis and, <laughs> and I don't want to do algebraic number theory anymore. Uh, and who, I think it was, was it Harrison who said to me, it's cheaper than buying a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> it's cheaper than buying a Ferrari. Uh, and because actually, because like actually formalizing a proof of Fermat's last theorem, which I kind of at the back of my mind think that I would be able to at least half do, uh, it would take me 20 years. Or it would take a team of people 20 years. Uh, whereas these things here, digitizing an undergraduate curriculum, or formalizing a hundred definitions or formalizing a thousand definitions is manifestly doable as long as we get a bunch of people to come and do it. Uh, and because getting undergraduates to formalize undergraduate level mathematics might make them learn undergraduate level mathematics in a different way. Uh, and Imperial have funded a postdoc, Athena Toma, uh, who's a student of Paolia, Paoli Anone, uh, who went to a lot of my lectures and watched the students. Uh, Watch the sheet. I, I use lean in my undergraduate lectures sometimes. And she's writing a paper about my interventions and how this will change things. Uh, and, and, you know, who knows where F abstracts will go? Who knows? Nobody knows, but some cool things might happen. Uh, and, but really, this is really what I'm motivated by. I want to get more people like, how many people in this room are really, you know, proper, normal, I mean, proper, <laughs> Mathematicians like me, people people that don't do category theory or whatever, people, people, people that actually do what mathematicians think of as math. What Larry argued that there was no way to do all of mathematics in some system by some Gerdelian diagonalization argument. But you see, that takes you out of the realm of what I believe mathematics is. You see, I think mathematics is like number theory and geometry and topology and algebra. It's you know, it's you know. An, an analysis. It's quite no, narrow, no, what I think. No, it's not. That's not mathematics. That's some. <laughs> that's some foundational thing that we. It's that, I'm, I'm taking it. It's you know. I, I'm being. I'm being. I'm not. Rep, I'm not saying that myself. I'm being somebody else in my department. Right. Yeah. Set, we don't have a set theorist in our department. 
right? If there was a big, if we thought set theory is an important part of mathematics, then we would we would be looking to hire set theorists. That's the truth of it. That's the truth of it, right? But when I say mathematics, I mean what a mathematician thinks of as mathematics. And set theory and category theory don't really count. That's just we don't know that in Australia. It's, it's, and so Patrick is a great example of a normal man, right? Patrick. You know, there are a few, a few people in this room. Neil is a, a mathematician. Who else? Scott and... Well, I, like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm just doing the bit that I think other people will... You know, we formalise set theory. I don't think people are going to care that much. It's somehow... Whereas I say we do perfectoid spaces, yet mathematicians kind of notice. That's the thing. Uh, so I... Yeah, and I might have other ideas. So my talk is about what I found difficult, right? That's uh, so when you try and you get a you get a normal mathematician, and you say now try and you know tell us what you're you know try, now try and use this computer. It's difficult, right? Because maybe they think set theoretically, or maybe they haven't ever really thought foundationally at all. Uh, whereas. Whereas you have to learn, you know, you have to learn how to use these systems. So I learned how to use lean. This is what lean is. Uh, somehow it's whatever calculus of inductive constructions and this stuff that you know is tedious implementation issues, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and the three projects I've done in the I've been in this game for under two years. The three things I've done is firstly I formalised the solutions to my own example sheets, which I found phenomenally difficult. Uh, <laughs> And it really taught me a lot about my own course, which a few years ago, I would never, if you'd said to me there were more things I could learn about the first year introduction to proof course at Imperial College London, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> I learned a lot of things about what mathematics was by basically doing my own course from this new point of view. Uh, and after that, uh, so that, that ran whatever, a year and a half ago, and then I decided to do schemes because I'm interested in schemes, and they seemed like a nice formalizable <laughs> thing. Uh, and I did this with three undergraduates, and uh, then when that was done, we did perfectoid spaces. Me and Patrick and a guy called Johan Komalan, who's not here, it's a postdoc in Freiburg, who's putting his neck on the line. He's a, he, you know, he doesn't have a tenure job, and he's doing something which is most definitely not mathematics, right, as far as all the people that are going to be giving him jobs are concerned. So it's a high-risk strategy from Johan, but he's, you know, me and Patrick, we're sitting pretty with our tenure. So those were the three projects I did, and of course they, you know, doing, actually doing lean teaches you a lot about what it means to do lean. And also I had money from Imperial to supervise 20 undergraduates who just did random things, uh, and I just watched them. So that's it, really, as far as introduction goes. Uh, but, the, I mean, this is really what's going on. I think that you have to be more appealing to mathematicians and the way that that needs to be done is you mustn't just let your libraries just drift off into, you know, logicians formalizing logic stuff, because we look at it and we don't see the kind of mathematics that we think is important. So I want, I'm trying to make the Lean Maths Library go, you know, directly straight towards the kind of people that are sitting in my department that have no idea what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, but because, you know, but they have read my papers in number theory. Uh, so I'm, I really want to get in the face of these people, of my colleagues. You know, I have direct access to them, and, and I, I, can't con you know, I can't contact them at the minute. And so in dis instead I'm going for the students, who I find eminently contactable, uh, and who I've had a lot of positive feedback from. And so I'm just going to have to wait. This is a, you know, I'm playing the long game with the star. So why lean? I mean, I've used lean. I mean, maybe other things are better. Maybe Unimath will be better in the end. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe Cock was fine. Maybe Isabel is fine. I just don't know. Uh, but, but one thing about lean is that lean is kind of mathematician facing. Because I, well, I'm trying to make it, you know, do the kind of mathematics that mathematicians sort of come across in their daily life. Uh, and, and I think that Tom is going to need mathematicians. Uh, so that's the end of the introduction. And then, oh no, it's not. Oh, this is, that's right. This is, this is, so what the talk's going to be about is the problems I faced. And there are four kinds of problems. Uh, the first one was because, you know, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and the, the second one is, 
second one is when I say, you know, Patrick gets frustrated because he can't prove trivial lemmas about subtraction of natural numbers, but it's because there's a missing tactic. You know, and they say, oh, you should be using cock. Uh, and, and thirdly... This one is no longer missing. No, no, you see, that's the thing. The point of this talk is that things get done in me uh, because of the way, I don't know, really know why, but it's just true. Things get done. So that your natural subtraction got done, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so kind of not, mathematics, we don't care about tedious implementation issues. Uh, mathematics runs at infinite speed, and, there's, and that's it. You don't ever have to compile it. You, you don't even have to maintain it. You write the PDF and you're finished. Uh, and, and unfortunately, <coughs> when you start doing it on a computer, you have to learn a little bit more about what goes into this stuff. Uh, but one of the biggest problems is really is that you get things happen which, you know, there's some point where a mathematician doesn't have to write anymore because they've convinced the mathematician, you know, that's marking their exam or marking their homework. Uh, and it's a bit frustrating when you get to the point where you're done and you're not done. Uh, so uh, so that I'm not going to talk about learning curve issues. You know, this is not really true. Is fear improving in lean is a much, much more mathematician friendly document than, than a lot of the, you know, a lot of the documentation I've seen for other systems. But, um, you know, but it is, but it doesn't tell you how to prove, you know, it doesn't tell you how to use norm, it doesn't tell you use norm now. Uh, so I'm going to write my own documentation. I do, I'll keep saying this and then I'll have to do it. I'm going to do it this summer. I said I'd do it last summer, but when you have 20 undergraduate students, they take up like 100% of your time. Uh, so I, I'm on Twitter I, I, as of last week. So I, Twitter just looks horrible to me. It's just full of hate and people telling women how terrible they are and that they're going to rape them. That's the impression you get from reading the papers about what's happening on Twitter. Uh, I'm now on Twitter <laughs> because apparently there's lots of 20-somethings that are big influencers. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to try Twitter. If it turns out that it is horrible, I'm going to go away then. It'll be after your breath scent. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe. I mean, maybe I'll have to put up with stuff. I don't know. I have a YouTube video. I gave a talk at the, I gave a talk at the Royal Institution in London, and uh, they put it on YouTube, and I got a lot of hate from that. It was quite upsetting, really. Just people saying, this person clearly knows nothing about P versus NP, which was kind of true. It was one of the reasons <laughs> it happened. <laughs> Quite why I decided to give a talk about it at the Royal Institution. I don't know. And like, just, just lots of people going, this guy's clearly on drugs. And like, this guy's wearing <laughs> stupid trousers. And, and, and these hatey comments all rise to the top. And, uh, and I just mentioned this to one of my kids, and they're like, Dad, don't look at YouTube comments. They're full of hate. Like, well, why am I even on YouTube? This guy's just getting disabled then. Yeah, yeah. I, the Royal Institution's in charge of that. They? they somehow bubbled down. A lot other students go, "Oh, he's my lecturer. He's great." You know, it's, and it's just sort of random. I just don't look at it now. Goodness knows what it takes now. Uh, so there you go. You can follow me on Twitter. And now the rest of the talk is examples. Uh, hi. My 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 daughter's middle name. My daughter is the only one in my family that's not remotely interested in mathematics. <laughs> no, it's named after my daughter's middle name. And uh, my, I wanted to teach my daughter mathematics, and I couldn't teach. I could teach everyone else in my family mathematics, but not her. And this is my reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I can teach you computer mathematics you know instead of attendance. Of, and stuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, really? For the same reason? No, I didn't know. That. That's fine. Uh, I, yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing, this is a sort of generic thing. What is a group? I mean, at, you know, at, at school, at university, we're told that it's a set, and there's a multiplication function, and there's these two other functions <laughs> that might not even be mentioned as part of the definition. There's an inverse function, an identity function, but they're somehow not relevant because you can work them out from the multiplication function once I tell you the axiom. And then there's some axioms. So in a maths department, you might not even see I and E as part of the definition. You might just see M. And then there's some axioms. Uh, right. And now the question is, uh, how, do we, how do we package that up in ZFC? Let's say we're doing mathematics in ZFC set theory because we're in a maths department. So is, it, is, is a group an ordered pair? Or is it an ordered four tuple? Or should we actually put some kind of type 
object in and make it an ordered five tuple? And the answer is, we don't care, right? This question never comes up in maths of art because this is a tedious implementation issue. That all, we know that you can do it in any number of ways and they're all the same, you see? This is the problem. Mathematicians have got a great idea about what it means for two things to be the same. And all of those answers are the same because they all give the same answer. Uh, and we're going to come back to being the same later. So and one of the things I had to learn was you have to learn to care a little bit. And so I now I care a little bit. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I, you know, I say, oh, I'm going to make this new thing. How should I do it best in Lean? Expecting Mario Carnero just to say, I'll do it like this. And, they, and he says, oh, well, you could try it like that, and maybe it'll work, and maybe it'll be terrible. And that was frustrating, because I thought that that was your job, you computer scientists. I thought you were supposed to tell me how to do these tedious implementation issues, because I certainly don't have a clue. And it turns out that this is all an experimental science. I didn't really realize this. Uh, it, it is all this whole thing is a, much more of an experiment than I'd realised. Uh, so that was an interesting thing to learn that I some I wasn't going to get the answers to the questions I wanted to you know the, these questions I'm not interested in and just want someone else to solve and they're sort of refusing to solve them. So that was interesting. Uh, this example I always trot out first question first part of the first question on the first example sheet that I was you know I was doing this in Berkeley. Uh, I was giving a course at MSRI, and in the evenings I was doing my own example sheets. And you've got to prove that x squared minus 3x plus 2 is... The idea, I'm teaching the undergraduates what that symbol means. It doesn't come out very well in Beamer, does it? I'm trying to teach the undergraduates what the implication symbol means. This quadratic equation's got two roots, x equals 1 and x equals 2. So the question is, if x equals 1 or x equals 2, then does x equal 1? And you can answer it correctly if you know what that symbol means. And of course the answer is it's not true because x can be 2. And that's the end of the that's the end of the answer if you're a mathematician, and then all of, you know in Lee you suddenly got to prove this you've got to prove these two statements here, and ma what is a math I mean that that's dumb because you can you know you what do you do now, and and I asked on the chat and they were like oh yeah that's really difficult because the real numbers are really complicated, and I said that's unacceptable, and six weeks later or so. Uh, it is, it's not there, right? This is a really stupid math. This is a trivial math question, and it's not. In th that's not theorem the proving in Lean's job. Uh, and 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 then it gets solved, right? Mario says, "Oh yeah, there is some kind of half-written norm num. It just needs to be put in the interactive tactic namespace." And a few weeks later, it's there, and I can solve these things by just writing norm num, and it solves them both, and the goal gets closed. So it's frustration, complaint on the Lean chat, solved. So it's great, right? That's that's how that's how this this is working. So and just the same happened with ring, uh, proving that a add b all cubed is what everybody knows at school. This is you learn this at school, and then you come to university, and then you can quote that, right? That's in your database of and if someone says prove it, you'd say multiply it out, right? You multiply it out in lean, you get eight terms, all of which are bracketed together in completely crazy ways. And to actually get those a squared b terms next to each other and to turn them into a 3a squared b, it was, you know, it's a, it's a little combinatorial puzzle game that we just do in our heads. And it's not acceptable that you can't do that. You know, mathematicians have to be able to do that trivia. And it got fixed. It got fixed because Mario just made... Um, where did it go? Oh. Uh, Mario made a ring tactic and, it got, and now you can just type by ring and it does it. Uh, so those are, those are nice examples. This is a, sort of an example that, again, both Patrick and I found painful. Is that I just said, oh, let's do number, th if the real numbers are so hard to use, let's do number theory. And all of a sudden, we're kind of subtracting naturals and dropping into the integers and then moving back again, because the naturals live in the integers. They're a subset of the integers. I mean, when we want them to be, they are. That's the thing. Whether, whether or not the naturals are a subset of the integers depends on whether we want them to be or not, because both answers are correct. Uh, so we're doing maths and we want them to be in there and then like we're occasionally dividing then they're rationals and then they're integers you know and then all of a sudden we proved a statement about two rationals being equal but they were supposed to be a statement about two natural numbers being equal and that's the same question uh, and it's not the same question in mean because it's not the same question in type theory uh, and, and I was really surprised I was like oh, I'll do number theory number theory is going to be easy this is all great it's going to be easy and all of a sudden they were like this is hell what were all these up arrows you know they're cast uh, and it, it, was mu it was a really bad experience because I incorrectly told these students how easy everything would be and it was really difficult. Uh, and this might have been solved as well. Have you used this tactic? No. Does it work? 
Yeah. Okay, great. So, you know, I can play this thanks to Rob, right? It's, Right, this, this guy, yeah, Paul Nicholas, who I don't know. But Rob noticed <coughs> that it needed doing, and the mathematicians were complaining, and he got someone to fix it, and now apparently it's been fixed. And it's in the, is it in yeah. math? Lo in yeah. math yeah. So this is sort of what's, you know, the general picture. There's some things that aren't quite fixed yet, but this is the general picture of my experience as a mathematician trying to use lean, is that it's hard, and I complain, and then it gets fixed. So I haven't tried this tactic yet, but we hear, hello, no. I can't so in Isabel that works, so you work in any type that belongs to the type class of three, and you and B will have N subset of J. The subset. And the subset, and they are both S. They are both the range of the function that converts to the maximum of its or integers into whatever ring you happen to be working. Yeah. I mean there are there are, I'm sure that, I mean I'm sure there's lots of ways to solve this tedious implementation issue. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, all I'm saying is that we had a problem and now it's gone. Uh, so this one, this one never really got solved and maybe it doesn't have a solution. This, again, last question on the first example sheet. Another thing I teach the students is this funny little is an element of symbol that they don't really see in school is a subset of symbol. So there's a stupid, there's a pathological, there's a pathological set and it, you know, here's some questions. And, you know, then the students can try and work out whether these, you know, because normally you don't have something can be an element of something and a subset of something, but of course you can make sets where this can happen. You know, and then the students like, you know, does that even make sense? Somebody writes that by accident, and then somebody asks if two actually is a set, and then you kind of say, well, actually everything is a set. That's how it works, except it might not work like that. This is an implementation issue. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a funny it's a funny question, but you know, it's all you know. The students get interested. They realise that there's things about numbers they don't really understand. And that's why it's there, and I try to do it in lean, and they're, all, they're just saying, oh, you can't do that in lean, because you can't make that set, because the elements aren't all at the same time. And this was a big shock for me, because, because this just looked like a completely natural question. Uh, and, and, but it just turns out types aren't a very good fit for that question. And that was a bit frustrating, because I did want to ask a question of that nature, but I found somehow to formalise it, you had to kind of formalise set theory within type theory. Uh, which, uh, which has which, been done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending on types, you can make lists whose make elements are not all the same type, or sets whose elements are not all the same type. I thought this was about how great dependent types are. Yeah. Know? And now you prove that you haven't a clue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying I have a clue. I don't know anything about types. I'm a mathematician. But I, it was just frustrating that I couldn't just use. There was this thing called set, and I thought, great, set X, that must be it, and it wasn't it. And it and so it's just a shame, because I don't really care about whether I can make that set or not. I just put nice questions that test whether the students understand what these things mean. And all of a sudden, the range of questions I could formalise was somehow smaller than I wanted it to be. So, so I just kind of gave up on that kind of question. Uh, which I'm slightly unsatisfied, because students do need to learn that this, these are, it's difficult... <coughs> Some students get these things mixed up, uh, so it's important to teach them that they're not the same thing. But I lost a question. This is sort of the only question on all the example sheets that I ended up losing. Uh, it didn't get formalised. But you could sort of argue that type theory is sort of pointing out when they are confused, that right? I mean, it's sort of automatically doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, at the time, this was only on the first example sheet, I was thinking, but sets like this show up all the time in maths. This is going to be a nightmare. And then it turns out they don't. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I hadn't realised. <laughs> they just show me the first example. Where they turn up is in the artificial examples on undergraduate <laughs> Makes you wonder what we're doing, doesn't and, it? Exactly. And, where, and why they turn up is because of a mistaken belief that so fundamentally <laughs> as formalised by von Neumann is a right foundation for mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get beyond that. I know. And it's taken me till I'm 50 years old to realise that. So this is the actually this it's not true that this was something else that I never ended up formalising because I I had to lecture this and I never liked lecturing it because I was always unhappy with the way it was treated uh, in the book there was this because this there's this statement I mean it's what I realise is that actually the, the treatment is like manifestly absolutely incomplete now uh, I'm, I mean I don't really know. This is what you. This is what I'm supposed to tell the students. This is what it says in the book. You you try and prove. You reduce the question to, for, for convex polyhedra to a question about planar graphs. This is the book proof. 
by projecting onto a you know, but they don't really even define planar graphs. Like, do the edges have to be piecewise smooth or, I don't know. There's no definitions of anything. Uh, you give them Lakatos to read. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that's exactly what I did this year. Yeah. I said I, I refused to lecture. I gave the lecture on the board. I, I refused to type it up as part of the official course. I gave the lecture on the board, and I said, go and read Lakatos and just decide whether or not this is mathematics. Uh, <laughs> And I said, oh, but, and it's not going to come up in the exam. Uh, yeah, and I also showed them explicit examples to reasonable interpretations of at least one of the sentences in the book. Uh, and so I just, I decided I wouldn't lecture that. Yeah, the course is gone now anyway. The, the syllabus has been regenerated. Uh, this was, this is another. This is, this is now the main theme we're getting onto now. So let us be a set with two elements, and let's choose a random. Reflexive binary relations. I was very proud of this question. Reflexive binary relations on a set with two elements of transitive. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Proof by checking all eight cases. Uh, so you've got to write them down somehow. So you have to say, like, we'll log the elements of x and y, or 0 and 1, or something. So that, I think I, that's in the official solution. We'll log x is 0. And like, it's like, that's, that's not even true, right? There's, we, we just skipped a whole bunch of maths. Uh, this is, if some student writes that, I'm absolutely happy with that because all sets with two elements are the same. Uh, so you see there's this, there's this lemma that we don't prove, right? You've got a bijection between two sets and a binary relation on one. You can push it forward, get a binary relation on the other one. And I claim that notions of reflexivity and transitivity, move, they transfer over, right? And that needs a pr and the proof is quite fun and nice and simple. But it's not a proof that we would lecture because this is obvious, you see, it doesn't need a proof, uh, you see, because it, you, because you can just say that's it's fine. It's an axiom, it doesn't need a proof, otherwise it does. No, it doesn't, <laughs> is it, it doesn't need a proof in a maths department. It doesn't need a proof in a maths department, you see. And, and now it's, it's only, because, now I've got interested in formalising, it's only because I'm formalising that I noticed it's even there, and I spent 25 years in a maths department. You see, and actually, this, this proof should probably, I feel when you write the proof, it's like, this is kind of all obvious. You follow your nose. It, and th so it should be generated automatically. And it is, we're ge and I, in fact, it's easy to generate it automatically. You just tell, you tell it to a mathematician, and they generate it automatically in their brain without noticing like that. But in case here, the your system will say, if the cardinality of the set is two, then there exists x and y, x minus x y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. X, y, but it was, like, some people didn't put that. Some people, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or one, one, yeah, they have I mean, yeah. You say right. So if they put x and y, then that's fine. Then they've invoked the axiom of choice or something. So So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's gonna come up. Now students do get the concept of without lots of generality wrong by the apply it wrongly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but here I'm applying it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> but that means there's a conceptual difficulty then in knowing when to apply it correctly and when not to apply it correctly, right? So, so <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you have That's to know. To capture, right? You have to know what generality is, huh? Yeah. I think students are a bit craftier than that. That's right. You know, when you're not quite sure, you wrote with that, you get away with it. Nobody else has to do that. No. Do you know what a, you know what a ring is, right? Yeah. You know what a Cohen Macaulay ring is? Great, you're part of an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the experiment. You're a mathematician, right? Or at least you were. What do you reckon? Isomorphic in what category? Oh, yeah, and category of rings. How could they not be? How could they not be? Do you know what Cohen Macaulay means? No. Special number theoretic things. Can we do algebra things? They're isomorphic. They're isomorphic. As rings. As rings. As rings. Oh, yeah, and these are just properties of rings. So is it true? Exactly. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? <laughs> and so what just happened, right? We just did a weird experiment, right? And, and furthermore, if you ask someone that does know what they mean, right, 
Yeah. You know what Noetherian ring is. Sure. No, so it's so you can prove it, right? Yeah. I mean, what's the, the proof? Is it's obvious. <laughs> this is the thing. There's nothing. There's nothing to prove. There is nothing to prove. Okay. These definitions are really complicated. There's loads of things to prove. None of none of them are in the literature because it's all off, because the proof is generated by a tactic that's going on in a mathematician's brain. Right. So there's a mathematician's <laughs> code of conduct. Okay. And the the first rule is what Ian said. You don't make definitions if they're not isomorphism and variant. Then they're not allowed. And the and the second rule is when you need to check that definitions are isomorphism and variant, it suffices to say it's completely obvious. That's that's a satisfactory proof. Right? So that's our superpower. And that's one of the biggest problems with it, with formalizing a lead, is that we lose our superpower. Okay. Because we know what it means for two objects to be the same. right? That's what we're really good at. And isomorphic rings are the same. And so obviously, if R has some property and S is the same as R, then S has that property. Because that's what being the same means. And this is in some sense the biggest obstacle um, to, for mathematicians. Because what does it mean? Now, here's an example. That George will know about this. You've got subgroups of a group. You ran into this issue once, right? But what does it mean for two subgroups of a group to be the same? Oh, I'm going to reserve my judgment on that, right? The subgroups might be equal, or they might be conjugate, or they might be isomorphic, right? All of those are perfectly good notions of being the same in the context of group theory, right? And when I'm doing stuff with group theory, I want to pass from one to the other, and I'm absolutely free to pass from one to the other as long as I'm using the correct definition of the same, right? And I might, you know, it's, if it's... The, we can cheat. It's a superpower, right? It's not for, what we do is not formal. And so, computers. I say to computer scientists, well, obviously you have to formalize this because every proof, every time we do this, we're invoking a gigantic, you know, collection of trivial proofs. So we need a tactic. So that's what tactics do, right? They do the trivial stuff for us. But they keep asking me what this tactic should do, and I keep telling them the more gigantic list of things which are obvious to me. And it's absolutely clear that I'm re finding it really hard to formalise what it means for two things to be the same. Uh, and it's a bit like, because one great example of when two things are the same is when they're canonically isomorphic. And you look up the definition of canonical on Wikipedia and it says, the most beautiful map between two objects. And that's <laughs> going to be tough to formalise. <laughs> but that's what it says on Wikipedia. So this is the idea, right? If you've got this is this is exactly what Ian said. If you've, if you've got a property of groups, then for two isomorphic groups, it's going to be constant on that on that isomorphism code. So I don't know. So so I'm rubbish at doing formalization the proper way. So where are the two functions for this thing? Oh, when they output the same values. So why do you use the mean? I don't know. No, no, that, that's a bad choice. Then. You just gave the yeah. answer that says we should be using. You think 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 you I mean, it might not be, if you use it, then it might say if you do hash print axioms, but whoever writes hash print axioms? <laughs> yeah, maybe. This is a tedious implementation issue. I don't, I don't care. It's like, that's not my problem. My problem is trying to get maths to work. Right? How to define a group is a tedious implementation issue. Groups as first class objects, they can be equivalent classes. And then define your 19th and your 15th. Or we could use homotopy type theory. Yeah, but that's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, have some, we have group with a capital G. We have group with a small g, which is a type class. We, 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 we have group with a capital G. Uh, I just don't know, right? Don't ask me. The, talk to each other about Talk to other computer scientists. I don't know how to make groups. I know what a group is. You're just saying, you're just saying this way, which is the same as another way, is better. Like, maybe it is for you. I don't even care, right? This is the problem. I don't care, right? Kevin, do you want to be allowed to get on with your talk? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't 
so when we formalise, this, so now let me, this, I'm going to show you a much worse example of being the same. Uh, so it's not going to be 10 minutes, but there's the idea. So the integer z. Uh, this is a ring, right? A ring is something where you have kind of zero and one and plus and times. At least that's what you tell mathematicians. But it turns out, if you, for computer scientists, they want some unary minds as well. Uh, so a ring is something that has those things and is the obvious answer. And you have the integers, and they're great, but unfortunately, one of the, one of the four, you teach kids four things. There's plus, minus, times, and divide, and divide is missing. And the reason divide is missing is because you want to work with the integers because they're a useful thing to have. But you can't do divide. You can't do 2 divided by 3 because 2 divided by 3 isn't an integer. I don't care about rounding or just, you know, I know you can try to make it an integer, but it isn't. It's, it's a rational number. And so the integers are missing. And so you have these, the rationals where 2 divided by 3 does exist. And, and, uh, but if I only want to divide by 3 once and... I don't really want to get crazy with denominators. I could just decide, let, I want my ring, and I want, my, I want a third, because it just happens to be useful for what I'm doing. But I don't, I mean, that'll do. And I want, I want zero, one, plus, minus, and times. And so I need to make a new object that's got every integer, and it's got a third. Uh, and I can kind of do that, right? Because I can look at the subset of the rationals, containing the integers and a third, and then I can just apply all of these things and see what I get. And I get, it turns out I get these things. I get, it's not just denominated, I, I need times, I've got a third, so I need a third times a third. So you get, kind of get this, you get a over three to the n, over n at least zero, and I need zero. That's what you get. And that's a, and that's a subset of Q, right? So that, that lives in there. <coughs> so, you know, so we have a way of doing it, right? That's somehow the smallest subset of Q, which is still a ring, and it's got a Z and it's got a third in it. And then maybe a bit later, we decide we need a half. I don't know. So, so then we could even do, we could do like Z, and then a third, and then we could do a half as well. Right? Yeah. Because we, you know, and then, and then you know exactly what this is. This is now kind of A divided by 6 to the end, right? Because as long as I've got, as long as I've got powers, it's so we and and there we go. Or actually, if I if I'd realised that I I wanted the inverse of a third and a half, if I wanted one over three and one over two, I could have just done one over six, right? I could have done I could have done one over six. I could have just said, why don't we have an inverse of six? All these things live in here, right? And this is just equal to this, right? These two rings, this is equal, yeah. That ring there is equal to that ring there, because I'm making these rings as subsets of the rational. Because uh, it's a very natural way of doing them, and these and these z one over six and z one over three one over two, these are equal because they're literally they're equal subsets. Uh, and now the problem is, this all relied on the fact that I had the rationals lying around. That was quite you know I just had the integers, uh, but I had the rationals, and the rationals were big enough to do all the divisions I wanted because they're a field, and a field is what you get if you throw in division as well. So now the question is, what if I don't have a nice ring like the rationals lying around. What if I just have a ring R? Okay. And um, ring R rings can be quite annoying, like the clock arithmetic. You know, Z mod we're in England, in Scotland. So Z mod twelve, isn't it? So in Europe it's Z mod twenty-four. We have Z mod twelve. And Z mod twelve has this kind of annoying property that three times four is zero. And so you're never going to embed it in we really have fields product of non-zero things is non-zero. But I still want to do that. I have a ring. And I, I want to invert some element. That's something that mathematicians want to do. And so now you have to kind of do it in a bit of a tedious way, right? You kind of take pairs, kind of a comma n, with n an integer, and a in the ring. And I'm kind of thinking about that as a divided by r to the n. But this doesn't make sense, because there's nowhere where I can really do that division. So I can think about pairs a comma n, and then I can put some equivalent relation on them. So if a over n, you know, b over r to the n, those might be equal. If I can like, clear the denominators and they're equal, then they're equivalent. And I can look at equivalence classes. And that's great. I can make that. And then I can make this as well. There. And then I can ask if it's equal to R1 over Rs. And I can ask if they're equal. And of course they're equal. You see, because in the, the example, when R lives in a field, they're literally the same subset of the field. 
But when R doesn't live in a field, they're still equal because they're the same. You see, they're the same. They're canonically isomorphic. They're at, they're absolutely literally they are indistinguishable to me as a mathematician until I start formalising them in Lee, and then I realise that they're not remotely equal. They're completely different things because one is a you know because you know what they are. One's an equivalent pair, an equivalence class of pairs where one element's another equivalent. You know, this, in fact, this S isn't even this S, right? I even told you a lie. This S, this S is in this ring, right? Which, and uh, like, there's a map from this ring to this ring, and that map is, it's the inclusion. This map isn't even an injection in general, and yet the notation we use, we talk about it as if it's an inclusion. This is not even, an, if R is zero, this is the zero ring. Right? If R divides zero, then you, you lose stuff here. So it's really funny. And yet, in Milne's book on Italo cohomology, you read the notation at the beginning, and it says, canonical isomorphism will be denoted with the equal symbol. Right? Because this doesn't mean equals, this definitional equality or whatever, all these other weird equalities you guys think about. This equality means things being the same to a mathematician which is a much better kind of equality that you have so far failed to implement. <laughs> one, one reason, I think, is because we've so far failed to tell you what we mean by it, possibly because we don't actually know. <laughs> so there you go. And you it has the properties of equality, your logic is inconsistent. Yeah, I know, I know, but you see, that's because you're, doing, you're not doing the right logic, right? <laughs> <laughs> I it's easier to prove things in an inconsistent logic. I know, but you see, <laughs> you say that, but I mean, some aren't there systems where you assume type in type? You were telling me about type in type, right? You can do type in type. That works great. It solves all the problems of universes. And as long as you promise not to do Russell's paradox, then it works fine. And it's just the same. It works just the same here. This is absolutely fine. And the, the reason that it's not inconsistent is because we're not allowed to make predicates that don't obey, you know, we're not allowed to make predicates which are different for this ring and this ring. Because they're just not, they would not look right. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, we've got S, S bar. We're good at bar. That's, <laughs> or, you know, if I was in lean, I'd do up arrow S. I'm being a mathematician today. I mean, I mean, I mean, generally, sort of, you know, controversial. And I'll call it S bar. That's all right. But the, the the issue isn't that. The issue is this. The issue is the fact that they're not remotely equal, and yet we treat them as they're the same. And not only we treat them as they're Groffendi, Groffendi himself <coughs> treats them as if they're the same in EGA. And you ask any mathematician, they will they will say that EGA is one of the most formal pieces of mathematics they've ever read. And this, and this, you know. George, <coughs> it's inconsistent. This inconsistent notation is embedded in foundational mathematical literature because we don't treat we treat it well. We we have a convention. You must know this convention. <coughs> They're equal. They're the same. They're the same. So this really, really tripped me out. And the reason that you see, I think that there is, there's even some. There might even. You can somehow argue that there's some universal ring and R and S are some universal polynomial elements. And when you do things like that, then, then the universal object is probably an integral domain. So you can embed everything into a field of fractions, and then they really do become the same. Uh, but I don't quite know what's going on. So, so anyway. Uh, um, so you see, really what's happening is that these two objects satisfy the same universal property. Uh, <coughs> So there's a, there's a funny thing. And if the two elements satisfy the same universal property, then we cease to be able to tell them apart. Uh, and most mappers, you just don't really understand the subtlety here, because it doesn't matter to, it doesn't matter to them. We, we work up to equivalence, where two things are equivalent if mathematicians regard them as the same. Well, so you would, well, you would say that your experiments with Lean taught you things that you didn't want. No. <laughs> <laughs> they taught me things that I never dared to believe. I don't know. They taught me things. They opened it opened my eyes, for sure. But I'm just representing my tribe. Yeah. 
And I think they are the same still. And it's just like a, an implementation issue that you people haven't solved yet. You know, I, I have a very... All these people saying what, for, what foundations I should be using, I'm very unclear, really. I've learned one of them. I've learned how lean works. Uh, and you see, there's another example. This is... Grothendy calls these rings equal. He says, you know... and. Uh, he literally uses the word equal in EGA. I went and looked up the definition of a scheme in EGA. So they're not equal, in, at least they're not equal using Lean's equal sign. And so the problem, the problem gets worse and worse. So we formalise schemes, and that involved formalising theorems from EGA. And I asked, and there was some lemma that involved the multinomial theorem. And Chris's Hughes, an undergraduate in theory, was very good at manipulating finite sets in Lean. So I got him to do it, and he proved a lemma about about rings that look like this. And I gave him the exact lemma, because I didn't write my roadmap, I gave him the exact lemma that it said in the book. I said, this is what we need, can you do it? And he proved it. I, we took it out of the Stacks project, because it's easier for undergraduates. Like, undergraduates don't know what a book is. So he said, here's a website. <laughs> here's a website, can you do exactly what it says in the website? And this website is incredible. You know, the Stacks project is very formal and carefully written. So we formalised the lemma exactly as it said in the Stacks project, and then I mumble along, and I'm nearly there, and I nearly do it, and then suddenly when you try to apply it, it turns out that we just want a lemma that's the same as the lemma in the Stacks project. And, and, and it was really the same in an extremely weak way. <laughs> <laughs> and what we need, I mean, what, this was one of the issues that came up. The, the ring R was another localization, A1 over Q, and all of these things, when you localise something else, we, we exactly needed to identify localising, inverting Q and R, with first inverting Q, and then inverting a thing that we're going to call R, but we actually secretly know isn't even called R. It's called R with a little piece of notation that means it's skin colour. And so the lemma was insufficient to finish the job. Uh, <coughs> but the lemma said that certain image equals some other image, or, you know, the, the lemma said that the equaliser of two maps was equal to some other thing. It was quite, and it was, and it was a mess, right? Even if, even if I had, you know, I had some, I had three rings up here that I told Chris to prove something about. I had three rings here, which was the rings that I actually wanted to prove something about. And now I've got some equal, these maps here that I call equals. And then I've got to identify the image of this with the kernel of this. And I, I proved that the image of this is the kernel of this or the elements in the kernel of this that have some other property, and I have to transfer all the proofs down. And now I'm beginning to think, I want these people to write this tactic, but what actually is the statement I need here? Because what's going to, you know, if you imagine everything as being equal, you don't even see this issue at all. And they are equal. These things are equal, right? You've got it, you've got equals wrong. You've had so many attempts, and you've got it wrong. Because, because until these things are equal, I don't know. Homotopy type theory. I don't want to do go there. I look at what they've got in, in the Unimap library and it's nothing compared to what we've got. So I, I wrote a bunch of horrible code that fixed, I mean, I literally proved all the things we wanted. And, and by the end of it, I'm looking at this definition of a scheme thinking, is this actually right? I mean, he's not checked anything. You know, what is going on? This rigorous piece of mathematics is incomplete. And if that's incomplete, then, you know, other people have seen me talk about the kind of stuff that we're actually producing. It's unbelievable. So I just think we should, this should be solved by a tactic, but I don't actually know what that tactic should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've just said all this. So I don't really know what the problem is yet. So the status, the status of this issue uh, is that I have to actually work out what it means for two things to be the same. So as I say, you can probably do some universal argument and reduce to some, and reduce to some <coughs> universal case where things become integral domains, and you can check equality in the field of fractions. And then you have, then you'll have to, you know, you'll start to chase a whole bunch of diagrams. Or alternatively, you could jettison Chris's result about about the actual localizations, and instead prove things not about this ring here, which is an explicit collection of equivalents started, but prove things about every ring that has the correct universal property. And that involves quantifying over all rings, and then I have to choose which universe all these rings are in. And then there's some worry about, am I being sufficiently universe polymorphic? And this is a tedious implementation issue as far as I... I mean, there aren't any universes in the way I do math. There's just one called, like, the, the universe of everything. 
That's the, you know, that's the only universe you need. Uh, so it's sort of funny. So and um, and then you know, just great. I you know, I use I use the universal property. I prove that the functors are naturally isomorphic, but I've still got explicit statements about an image being a kernel. I'm kind of in trouble. Uh, and the and and if you if I give up on you see we've got levers about this. This is a concrete object, and the undergraduates have proved levers about this object that we needed. For example, I remarked that the map might not be injective, but we know exactly what the kernel is. Uh, and now I'm going to have to prove an analogous lemma about all rings with the same universal property. This all sounds like a bit of a nightmare. So as I say, I fixed it with a whole bunch of unreadable spaghetti code, and then I said I'd done schemes. And you know, and it taught me a lot about, one of the things it taught me was how I should have done schemes, of course. Uh, and then Neil just came along with some completely innocuous post that took me weeks to understand, uh, but somehow he magically he he did a magic thing, and he just wrote down instead of quantifying over all rings, instead of saying what does this R one over R want to be? Well, it has this property that for all rings A, if I've got a map from R to A and the image of little R happens to be invertible, then I can extend it uniquely to some map. You know, there's some universal property. But Neil wrote down a completely different property. He just literally. He just analyzed that map there, and he wrote down a list of necessary and sufficient conditions that a map from R to A had to satisfy to be isomorphic to this thing here. And they were completely internal. They were the universal property. There were some consequences of the universal property that did not involve, that did not involve equals, right? Whether those things or isomorph are used as isomorphic. He wrote down a list of properties that this map had to have in order for there to be an isomorphism with this read that made that diagram commute. And it was just like four or five properties. He said, well, the kernel, some property of the kernel, some property of the image. He wrote down this list of properties that just looked a bit bizarre to me. And, uh, and I realized that, in fact, maybe that was the right way of thinking about these things. So I had to start thinking about maps in a slightly different way. So now the issue was to prove the analog of Chris's lemma, not just for this explicit thing, but for all rings satisfying the properties that Strickland had that isolated. And then we looked at the proof, and it turned out that the only things Chris ever assumed about this localization were precisely the things that Neil had isolated. So the proof was trivial. All we had to do was change the thing, the statement of what we were proving. It was a really bizarre, because I thought, now we've got to reprove it. This is some horrible multinomial thing here. But the proof stayed the same, but the objects we were proving these about changed. It was quite a funny experience. And all of a sudden, our lemma was now about all rings isomorphic, all rings equal to this in my sense, and the whole thing just went through perfectly. So some magic occurred that I don't really understand, and that's one of the reasons I'm talking about it. So I need to wrap up. Uh, so we did perfectoid spaces. Uh, maybe I won't talk about them. I mean, there's a maybe I'll show you the graph. But perfectoid space is a really complicated thing. A perfectoid space is a definition. My impression that there's that's a perfectoid space. Yeah, you can. That's like a dot is a. I don't know what a dot is a theorem or something. Maybe it's, it's a, it's a definition or a lemma. Or there a you go. Where is that special one? That, that's the perfectoid that's space, the, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the one. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and I let's not talk about implementation issues. There you go. That was the problems we had. Like sometimes things didn't work. Sometimes there were two things that were equal by definition, but definitional equality is undecidable in D. Uh, and raffles sometimes wouldn't work because there needs to be an algorithm that approximates it and it would time out because our terms were just too big because we were incompetent. Uh, that was what we learned. Uh, so there you go. And how are I doing? Oh, I've got a couple of minutes yet. Maybe I should need to. Well, I say we keep time for questions. Yeah, oh, okay. All right. Well, then maybe I'll follow. So, so, so that's the end of the examples. This is, this is the wrap up slides. So, where now? So, I need to kind of understand what I mean by being the same because I am a formalist and I've been, un, I've been undone by these experiences. Uh, and, and I wonder whether. And it also, I had to change the lemma. I had to change a lemma in the stacks project to some other lemma. To, instead of being a lemma about this ring here, I had to prove a lemma about things that satisfied the universal property of that thing there. I mean, how many other levers do we have to change? I don't really know. Uh, but I'll tell you something. If we actually do examples of perfectoid spaces, we need some fancy topological completion of localization issues. So it's going to bite me again at some point. 
But apart from this, apart from me not really understanding what's going on, Lean solves my, the Lean <coughs> user people are solving my problems. And so that's why I'm using Lean, is because things are getting done. So here's an example of a problem that the Lean user people solved. And it was something that was thrown out to us on Monday. And uh, it's done. We did it. We chatted. We had some ideas. People worked. And I don't know. So what was that? A day and a half. I mean, you can't cube a cube, so Frake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's done. It compiles. It compiles. So you can put that 93% up to 94%. Yeah, you can't cube a cube. You can't chop a cube up into smaller cubes. And this is the community that I found myself in. And it's really exciting, it's vibrant, it's, it's exciting, it's vibrant, it's dynamic, and things things are getting done. And it started out because of your question. Yeah, I asked, I brought it up on the chat because of your question. And it took a few lines? Oh, no, 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 600 lines. 600 lines. I just gave you the last few. Yeah, there's some, I don't think not correct is a lean thing. I don't know what not correct does. In fact, it's a proof of false. Uh, so I think that lean. I didn't talk about perfect choice phases, but they but we they work in the uh, they work, and so I think that fabstructs can work. I I think I can teach mathematicians to use it. Uh, the support from the people to solve the issues that I find tedious has been phenomenal. Rob and, and many others have been great, and and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to sell this stuff. Uh, to regular mathematicians, but this is an example of something that I need to get my head around. And that's it. Thank you very much. There is another thing I learned by uh, formalizing mathematics, and I can follow it with them as well. And, and we can start with a very simple example of being the same. Yeah. And then it seems to be the same fraction. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, two, two, two quarters, the same fraction as one half. Yeah, or, yeah. Or not. So there are various answers to this question. One stupid answer is that there is an injection from the, or not, not injection, a function by being x fraction to a rational number. There are rational number fraction and the function. Another is that there are two notions of being the same, being the same fraction or being the same. Uh, uh, rational number, yeah. but this is a stupid question as well. And uh, uh, answer as well. Another possibility is that we have the rational number, mm -hmm. and we have notations from natural numbers which are fractions. And the uh, mathematicians are very reluctant to use notations within the mathematics, but sometimes they do, as with fractions. Another example which leads to, to this one is the example of a polynomial. Uh, you, you, you can have two different polynomials that are the same function. Sure. Um, and polynomials can be seen as notations for, 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 for functions. And the way you introduce formal polynomials is very similar to the way you introduce terms in logic. Of course, there are no logicians in, in, a, in a proper math department, but still people are defining polynomials. So uh, At school, they're defined as functions, right? Not quite. Do, I think that at school... No, no. The base the field is the reals or the complexes, and they're thought of okay, as, okay. as functions. And then at university, they're thought of as this. So, uh, what, what, what maybe uh, we have to change in, in the way we do mathematics usually is we have to be slightly more aware on the fact that within mathematics, there are mathematical objects that are notations for other objects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know about this, though. This looks like two different. I mean, that, you're talking about equality of terms. This is equality of types. I mean, these are two notations for. Uh, you, you have, you have well. two kinds of notations to speak of the same yeah. object. But then I don't. Yeah. So but, are they the same, or are they just canonically isomorphic? Thank you for your and uh, answer. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm nothing um, if not candid. Earlier in your talk, you said you think you're done, but you're not done. Yeah, yeah. And there are lots of examples in mathematics where uh, that perseverance has led to real insight. So, for example, the discovery of the positive triangle from looking for complex roots of equations, not ignoring that. But beyond notions of sameness and equality, are there any insights you've got so far where you thought you were done and you weren't? No. Well, I mean, I suppose the schemes thing is an example. I mean, we've. I mean, teaching me that I should be very careful when I'm 
formalizing any theorem about localization is very, you know, I formalized one and I got it wrong. I, I wonder now, if we start proving lemmas about schemes, I might have to, yeah, I, I look at this and I see a warning sign now, because it <coughs> burned me once. But I mean, in a sense, you know, the whole of higher category theory